All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am your Clio host today. My name is Michaela, not to be confused with this amazing Michaela beside me. Um, I first wanted to share kind of what I do at Clio because I think it's pretty relevant to this talk. Um, I actually run the marketing of this conference and part of my job is to select the content of this conference. So if there's something you really liked or didn't like, I would love to know, but more the like, because I like to be validated. Um, but uh, we received hundreds of applications this year on different talks from so many amazing legal professionals. And I think when I came across Angela and Michaela's, I was so blown away because their firm, Conan and Dunn, is doing not just saying that they're putting wellness first or breaking the cycle of burnout in the legal industry. They have practices that are tried and true, and I think it's going to be a really amazing session to learn from them. So I'm really excited to introduce Angela, who is a partner at Conan and Dunn. She is, um, specializes in collaborative divorce. And Michaela, who at the age of 21 became a paralegal. So Michaela brings so much wealth of information, knowledge, and um, life experience to her work. Um, and one thing that's also really special about um, their firm is they were the winner of our Legal Innovation Award last year um, as part of our Reisman Award, so our customer awards at Clio, for their work with the Untie Online, which is a, a online system that makes divorce accessible to lawyers across Nebraska. So it's my really big honor and privilege to welcome you both to the stage today. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. You have a super cool name, by the way. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Michaela. Um, before we start talking about lawyer burnout, um, we wanted to give you a little bit of background information about our law firm so you have context for kind of who we are and how we do what we do. When we kind of start talking about some of the details. And so, um, like Michaela said, my name is Angela Lennon. I'm a divorce lawyer at Koenig Dunn in Omaha, Nebraska. I am Michaela, Angela's paralegal, sidekick, you name it. Um, been doing this 23 years and love what I do. So. so our law firm was founded in the 1980s um, by our founding partner, uh, Susan Koenig. And when we started thinking about our presentation today and work-life balance and lawyer burnout, uh, one thing that really stuck out to both Michaela and I is um, back in the 1980s when our founding partner um, founded our firm, there was no such thing as work-life balance. Um, she brought her infant brand newborn baby to her office and she had a desk and a crib. And so that's sort of where we started from in terms of the foundation of our firm into where we are now today. And so we started with Susan, who um, there was no such thing as work-life balance for her. And we've evolved and really grown into not only um, you know a mid-sized law firm in Omaha, but we've really grown our culture, which is something that we are so proud of and that we hold very dear and precious um, to an integral part of who we are um, and how we're able to do what we do in a sustainable way. So when we... Uh, when I first joined the firm, I joined in 2008 as the receptionist. I had applied to law school and deferred for a year, and I really wanted to get some experience in the legal industry before I committed to um, fully committed to going to law school. And so at that time, we had four lawyers and four support staff. Um, fast forward to 2014. Michaela joins the law firm. And at that time, we still only had four lawyers. Um, and today we have 10 lawyers and 13 support staff. So we've re we've doubled in size um, over the not even 10 years. Um, so we've had to evolve our culture pretty rapidly to adapt to that growth and caring for a bigger team. And so when I joined in 2014, so almost a decade ago, and just so you guys know, I've been supporting Angela like 10 years and we just had our first fight this weekend. Gosh, I can't so, stop. And we still love each other, but anyway. 
Um, no, we had, ex so I kind of consider myself the end of the OG before we had our big expansion and growth. And really in terms of how we made it through that expansion, Cleo was an integral part of supporting our growth. Uh, we uh, brought, implemented Clio in 2018, came off another case management software program that just wasn't working. Part of our goal was to move to the cloud. So we did that in 2018. And then in 2020, we implemented Clio Grow. So that's a little bit about who we are and how we've grown. Um, when we really were thinking about our presentation today, um, what we saw from last year's Clio conference and some of the themes that we were hearing about in the different presentations and some of the data that came out of the Clio um, legal trends report, one of the major themes we saw was um, work-life balance and lawyer burnout. So the concept of burnout is nothing new. Um, it first began around like in our dialogue in the 1960s and 1970s. But it wasn't until 2019 when the WHO formally declared it a occupational phenomenon where we were really having the language to be able to talk about what we were experiencing. And for us, I know at our law firm, it wasn't like we weren't experiencing burnout before COVID. But when COVID hit, there was such an acute like crisis of everything, but especially of employee law firm burnout that we were feeling, we finally had the language. We, know, we knew we needed to find a way to address it. And part of that was first the language of even discussing it. Right. And I actually just found this out today. Today is actually a World Mental Health Day. Um, so I think it's super cool we're having this conversation today. I actually knew that in advance. No, Thanks. no I, I, I'm just kidding. I, I did. I, yeah. yeah. Good. So Good. Some people learn some things. So anyway, in terms of burnout, so having done this 23 years, I know I'm totally dating myself. And I remember the days when we uh, did ticklers on index cards in a Rolodex and you pull out. I get some nods here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for me, what burnout has felt like me over the years, off and on, exhaustion, disengagement, resentfulness towards maybe other team members that aren't working as I don't feel in the moment they're working as hard as me or maybe I feel like I'm just putting in too much and not getting the rewards um you know back so that's how it feels to be and then of course it carries over into your home uh, life what we do it's you know being a lawyer being a legal professional being a paralegal you know, it's just an integral part of who you are. So if you're burnout at work, it just carries over to home. So I don't, has anyone here been burnt out before? Are you burnt out now? Show of hands. That's like a lot of, that's most of the people in this room. Yeah, yeah. What, can we do shout outs? Like, can you, what do you feel when you're burnt out? Like, how does, what, what do you experience when you? Numb. Numb. No, that's a good one. Lack of focus. Yep. Yep. Tired. What with, what with family? Less patience with family. Absolutely. And that feels awful. Yeah. That feels awful. Yeah. So what the WHO characterizes burnout is, is you'll see in the, there's three different spheres. And when these different characteristics converge at the same time, at the center of those spheres is when we're going to see burnout happen. So we heard what you, you're tired. So the feelings of being completely depleted, feeling exhausted, um, you know, cynicism, detachment for um, your job, um, being negative um, when normally maybe you'd be a positive person or viewing everything through a negative lens. And then, you know, your ineffectiveness at work, your inability to perform your job at the level that you would have been able to otherwise. And so it's common that we all have these feelings or emotions at different times, but when we're feeling all three of these types of emotions consistently, that's when we're converging, we're really seeing acute burnout happen. Okay, so we know, like I know, or everybody in this room almost raised their hand about feeling burnt out. Um, I know how it feels for me just hearing that word burnout, like what it does, I get a, get a feeling in my stomach about, ooh, I know how it feels when we feel this way. Um, but it's no surprise whatsoever that we're feeling burnt out as a profession in general. 
Um, like I said, when Michaela and I got the Clio Trends Report last year, and then we listened to some of the sessions, um, we were not shocked at all that this is a topic that people would be interested uh, to hear about because the main theme that I pulled from the Trends Report last year was a need for a balance. That was the main theme that we were interested in studying. Um, so we see right now that casework caseloads are up 10% from the data report and billable hours are up 22%. So we're having more cases and we're billing more hours. Um, so that definitely could lead to some exhaustion. And most of us or some of us are unhappy with the legal profession in general. From April 21 to April 22, one in five lawyers left their jobs, which I am surprised by on one hand, but when I see that statistic, I mean, that is a lot of people leaving. And 37% of lawyers, it said, left for better paying jobs. 37% left for finding work-life balance. 31%, uh, 32% left because they dislike their company or the culture of the company. And then 21% of lawyers left because they weren't feeling connected to the meaning or the impact of their job. They were lacking that um, tying the why. Why am I working so hard? I'm not getting that emotional return on my investment. And then on top of that, we are blurring the lines of when and where we work. And so that was the entire idea of the data last year is we need balance. But what does that look like? And there was some really interesting data about that. So 49% of us say we like working from home primarily. Um, we also like to have predictable work schedules. And so the survey that Cleo put out said that most lawyers prefer to work traditional nine to five hours. However, 56% of us work after five o'clock, 28% uh, of us work after six, and 11% of us are working after 10 o'clock at night on a consistent and routine basis. So we're saying we wanna work nine to five, but we're not actually doing so. Um, on top of that, 76% of lawyers want flexibility and being able to control their own work schedule. So we're getting into a tension point is how do we make all of this work where we like to work from home, but when we work from home, we're kind of always on call or we have a hard time shutting off or we're always available. We like to work eight to five, but we also like to be flexible and set our own hours. Um, so it gets confusing and without, without clear uh, policies or being intentional about setting yourself up for success so you have those boundaries, the blurring of when and where we work is being skewed significantly. So we end up just working all of the time or we're never really able to turn off or disengage. And what I found very interesting, because I love working remotely. I love hybrid schedules. I love having flexibility and when I love to when work I, in my pajamas. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> of when I can work. But the data from Clio found that 74% of people who end up working a more traditional nine to five schedule, 74% of those people had either good or very good mental health or good or very good physical health. So there are positive correlations to working more standard hours, but a lot of us are saying we want flexibility in when we work and we want flexibility where we work. And so uh, it's trying to navigate what we want and getting the positive outcomes um, has been really tricky for all of us, obviously, because now we're all burnt out. And I think blurring the lines of where we work and when we work has a lot to do with it. So we are working more hours, we're maybe unhappy in the legal profession, we're blurring work-life balance. Um, so we really took a look at this data that Cleo put out and looked internally at our culture about what can we do intentionally to help either stop or break the cycle of lawyer burnout or what can we do to prevent burnout in the first place. And so one of the things that we did um, was employ the findings of this Aristotle study that Michaela is going to talk about. Yeah, so our team, our, our firm really emphasizes team. So the thought behind it, and this is an oldie but a goodie, um, back in 2012, Google did a study they called Project Aristotle. 
You can Google it. It's out there. The findings are absolutely amazing. Um, they spent two years studying 180 Google team members. The goal was they wanted to figure out what makes teams successful. What's the algorithm to predict success for teams? So they spent, they came up with like 250 different attributes that they could um, pin on teams. And they did over 200 interviews and intensely followed these teams for a period of time. So their hypothesis was that they thought the success predictors of good teams would be a team that had an experienced manager, a team that had unlimited access to unlimited resources. So budget, you name it, have whatever you need to get the job done, you can have unlimited resources. And the third thing was, let's put a few high performers on the team. So that's what they thought would predict a successful team. So Koenig Dunn has really embraced this team model of cross support. So I go on vacation for a week. We have another paralegal step into the, my role and can just pick up where I left off. Angela can rely on another paralegal. We kind of have our systems, processes all set up. This, so we rely very heavily on cross team support. Going back to the Aristotle project, the primary predictor of successful teams was an environment that included psychological safety. Completely outside of their hypothesis, blew people's mind. And they actually came up with five elements as a result of this study. But that number one, psychological safety, plugs into their algorithm of this is gonna predict a successful team if within that environment, they have psychological safety. So what does that mean? So really what psychological safety is, it's an environment in which team members can express thoughts, fears, admit mistakes without any fear of repercussion. I can admit that I just jacked this thing up and not where I'm going to lose my job. We expect people to admit their mistakes. We expect people to learn from them. We expect them to share them with the team so we can all learn from them. That was the primary predictor of successful teams. Um, components of psychological safety include, you know, having an environment which you can trust each other, open communication, we talk to each other, risk taking, you want your team members to take these risks without fear. If I fail, oh, there goes my job. Inclusivity, supporting diversity, all types, all people, you know, we support your perspective. We respect your perspective, not support. That was a bad word for that, but um, supportive leadership. Our leaders have to model, our partners need to model this for us. Feedback and learning, mistake tolerance. We've, we've got to learn from our mistakes and it's okay to make them. So essentially team members that felt valued, secure, safe to share their um, thoughts and opinions without judgment, those predicted successful teams. The other factors, all important, but um, the other four elements were dependability. Your team members need to know that they're going to get their work done. They're going to do what they say when they're going to do. That was a heavily weighted factor in predicting a successful team. Structure and clarity. We need to know exactly what the expectations are. What are our goals? Do we have shared intentions? We need to all be on the same page, but the more structure and clarity, successful teams. The work that these team members are doing together needs to have meaning and it needs to feel impactful. So those were the five elements of in predictors of successful teams that Google came up with um, as a result of their project, Aristotle. So we took the idea of psychological safety to heart. And then we looked at what are the policies or procedures or cultural expectations that we can do within our law firm to help take care of our people um, to prevent burnout. So one of the key components of our law firm's culture is we expect and we require vulnerability amongst each other. But you can only do that when your team is psychologically safe to be vulnerable with, because you don't get to be vulnerable with just anybody. You can be vulnerable with people who you can expect are gonna be vulnerable back with you. So 
it's something that we practice and something that we encourage. And we happen, so Susan Koning, the lawyer who started in the 80s working with our infant baby, is now an executive life and business coach for our law firm. And so we have this culture of coaching. Um, so we have the ability and the guidance of someone who's helping us all learn about the importance of vulnerability and modeling it and how to do it. And it's become a cultural requirement at Koenig Dunn um, in order to be a wholehearted team member, uh, we have to be vulnerable with one another. And that's done nothing for us except bring us closer together and reduce the amount of burnout that we have at our law firm. Um, one of the key components when we were thinking about how do we demonstrate vulnerability and how do we tie that into um, reducing burnout of our team members is one of the first things that we do on Monday mornings um, at eight o'clock uh, Monday is not a remote day. Everybody is in the office on Mondays for us. And we spend about 15 to 20 minutes at eight o'clock, first thing in the morning with every team member um, in a Monday morning meeting. And the purpose of that meeting really is to set the tone for the week. And we usually each say two words um, about that describe like where we're at emotionally, what's going on for the week. So if I am it, energized and I'm ready to kill it this week, people will know that. If I'm struggling with something in my personal life, um, not to make excuses for poor performance at work, but I want the team to know that, you know, something is going on um, behind the scenes here that's, I might be a little distracted this week, or if I seem, if you get a short response from me, you don't have to take that personally because you know that I have some special things going on in my personal life. Um, but we also set, set us up for success that week. So we go through any big, you know, if I have a trial on Thursday, the team will know that. Or if um, Michaela is really deep into deposition prep or discovery prep that week, she's going to be more heads down and not on teams as much. So we go through to what others can expect. And then at the, at the end of each person's um, go around, you know, we're saying, I am available to give support this week, or I am going to be asking or requiring support from others. And so we start that facilitation on Monday morning. So for us in our law firm, there really is no excuse for one team member to be in the weeds and drowning and someone else kind of breezing by. We really try to balance out who needs what at the very beginning of the week. But it doesn't work unless we're willing to be vulnerable with each other on Monday morning and say, you know, guys, I'm really in deep. I have so much on my plate. I'm really overwhelmed. Like, I think I'm going to have to reach out to another lawyer to help me on this status conference or what it, what have you. But that's just an example of how we use vulnerability, you know, first thing Monday morning to um, set our team up for success to make sure we're balancing out workloads. Um, another thing that we do, which is um, pretty unique, I would say, is we have a staffing every six weeks with all the team members and it's a couple of hours, so it's a really big time and money investment. Um, but one thing that we do is every team member is required to go around the room and we call them glorious failures and perfecting the positive. So our glorious failures are something in the last six weeks that we really messed up. And it's not like when you're in an interview and they're like, tell me the worst quality about you and you like wrap something up in a bow and pretend like it's bad, but it's good. If you are fluffy and you don't go deep, you know, we're gonna say, mm, what's underneath that? Like go deeper, tell us why you're saying that's a failure. Um, so you what- You get called out. You do get you, called out. Like, yeah. They'll be like, Michaela, come on, really? Yeah. Go. Yeah. And so the point of the glorious failure conversation is a, we want to learn from mistakes because we know everybody makes them. But if the team can see that I made a mistake, I messed this up, it was my fault, I'm taking accountability for it. Here's why I did it. I did it because I was rushing. I did it because I didn't use our systems. I did it because I wasn't asking for support because I really wanted to get this thing done and wh whatever it is. Um, if I know that I'm able to admit to mistakes, then it makes it easier for the next person down the road to if they make a mistake, they can admit it and we can learn from it. So we have a bunch of tools in our toolkits um, due to our coach. And so we always try to find, well, what can we do to prevent that mistake from happening next time? Or how do we rebound faster from a mistake? Um, but by the end of it, I bet a quarter of us have cried um, going through our glorious failures. And it's a 
bonding experience. But again, it only works if everybody's willing to be vulnerable with one another. Um, but then on the flip side, we do perfecting the positive. So what went really well in the last six weeks and why did it go well? Were, was there something that you were employing, like a tool or a tip or a technique um, that has set you up for success and can we learn from those as well? And that whole process freaked me out. When I started 10 years ago, I'm like, what is happening here? Like it, it's freak, like I had never been at a firm and I had worked at multiple firms before I had joined Koenig Dunn. If I were to say I'm overwhelmed, I need help, I'm not gonna get my work done. I need someone help. Like, I'd be like, they think I suck and they're gonna fire me. Like, so that psychological safety is crucial to have people even be able to say that. And it's okay to say that. But at the end of the day, we have leaders who want us to be there for the long term. And those are the things that if, if you can rely on each other. So I do drink the Kool Aid there now. I mean, I am. Totally bought into the whole, sorry, Angela, the, she probably, she's going to murder. I, um, the vulnerability thing was a game changer and it creates very deep connections and trust, but you have to have that psychological safety. So framework for communication and giving your team members the tools to exercise these small acts of vulnerability. And Angela said probably a quarter of us have cried there's been times when all of us have been crying together and it's like, what is happening? This is crazy, but it's amazing. It really is. Um, but our firm is really, really good. We have the expectation um, that we give each other feedback, good, bad, ugly, whatever it is. That is an expectation. It is not optional. And on our staffing agenda, there is actually a line item that says feedback fix. And our managing partner says, think, pause, is there feedback you need to give someone? And we all know, and we've all been trained that feedback is a gift. It's gonna make us all better. And when we look at our hierarchy of our firm is first, what's best for the team, you know, that elevates everyone. So that's one vehicle um, that we help provide. And I think having the permission, so many people, I know for me being at other firms, like I'm not gonna tell that person how to do their job. That's not my job. But we all have the expectation that we be above the line and we give the feedback where it's needed. But having that permission as a team member and as an employee is so important. Otherwise, I would never have done that otherwise. Um, the other tool that I really love that our firm has implemented, implemented is our burnout ratings scale check-ins. Uh, this was an agenda item not too long ago. And we told uh, the partners told the team um, Imagine your burnout levels as the color of the rainbow. So red, you are burnt out, done, like mm, you are in the middle on all counts. You know, orange, yeah, I'm there, you know, yellow. So you can imagine blue, you're great. So obviously they worked really hard to build this environment of psychological safety and we went around the room. I don't know if you want to talk about that. I was shocked at some team members that were in the red. Yeah, yeah. So we started doing this during COVID because we were all in crisis mode, um, just trying to survive. And we weren't around one another physically, so it was hard to really gauge how people were doing. Um, so we implemented the burnout scale, burnout tool, where at our staffing meetings, we're asking everybody going around the room, what color are you? And I was shocked. There were some people who I thought were probably burnt out were saying they're, they're pretty good or people who I thought were on their game, A plus, who were really struggling. And I just would not have predicted that had they not been brave enough to share that with how they were feeling. So we found that to just ask was just ask a question. revolutionary, but people had to feel safe enough to give the truthful answer. Um, so we started doing that during COVID and um, that translated into one of the other things that we then did was mandatory mental health days. Our people, when we had two thirds, three fourths of our team members in crisis burnout phase, you know, we want people on our team for the long haul. And if people are burnt out and they just can't hack it in the profession anymore, it's not worth it. They're done. That does nobody any good. And so we had required the entire team to take a mandatory mental health day one day a month 
but we did it intentionally and with structure. So people just weren't picking their own days on a Friday. You know, that, that wasn't how it was going to be. We went through admin, we went through paralegals, and we went through lawyers. And we looked at the calendar, we lined them all up so we had maximum support that we needed in the office, and the show was able to go on. But we required everyone to take a mental health day every single month for quite a long period of time, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it didn't get count against their PTO. And, you know, it was, um, they weren't, I'm not saying they weren't allowed to work, but the expectation was they were unplugged. If we were giving everybody a day off, mental health day, we didn't want them to use it to catch up. We didn't want them to use it to, um, you know, pop in on Teams or your email and bouncing in and out. We were really asking people to do their best to take that space and time um, to do some self-care or relax or what have you. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, and telling other, and I know not every firm can do that, but even in smaller levels, like those very small things, the investment, the return, uh, you have those invested team members for the long haul. So a couple of other things that we've done, um, you know, uh, we are managing partner at having her available to team members is so important. If you don't have the time to hear what your employees are really trying to tell you or ask the question, opportunities are being missed. So I love that she has that open door policy. Um, and then we do our yearly performance reviews. We do 360 reviews. Um, we review every team member in the firm. Um, and the managing partner will say, if you're reviewing a team member and I have feedback to this team member and I'm giving it to this person in the review and it is the first time this person is hearing about it, shame on you. You are not meeting expectations. That feedback should have been given directly to the team member. That team member should not be hearing it from me. So that's the level of expectation. And you know what that does is develop trust, which supports avoiding burnout. So you can unplug your team members can carry on when you're gone and keep your cases moving. Yeah, so we have the framework for the ability to be vulnerable and kind of the expectation. We have the framework for how we're communicating about how we're feeling, about our workloads, about our stress levels. And then you have to, then if your team is saying, well, we're burnt out, then what is, what's the solution? What are we gonna do about it? Um, and for us, one of the key components that makes this all work is one of our law firm's values is always team. So we're heavily invested in a team support model. Um, we care for our clients as well as we care for our team. Um, and our team is invested in the success of our clients and in the, in the success of our law firm. And so um, always team for us means like we are providing cross support. You know, I have my clients, Michaela is assigned specific cases. Um, so it's not like we're dipping in and dipping out on client support. But if I'm at the Clio conference today and I'm unavailable, I have absolutely zero worry that something on one of my cases is getting dropped because we have dedicated team members who are stepping in for cross support. Um, so having the ability to rely on your other team members and you don't have to worry that a ball is going to get dropped is something that takes a load off your shoulders and it can spread around the, the workload. Yeah. Yeah. And Clio is an integral part of that, having a system that you know every task that needs to be done on a case, you know every deadline. If I'm out unexpectedly, another paralegal can step in or Angela's deadlines can be looked at. That has been an integral part of being able to enable the cross-team support. So besides being able to communicate about work and stress loads, um, we thought we would talk a little bit about some of the policies and procedures that we've implemented that we've seen a good return on our investment for in terms of um, longevity of employees, retention rate of employees, and reducing burnout. Um, one of them is, okay, flexible schedules. How it used to be, you know, pre-pandemic is we were a pretty traditional law firm in the fact that, you know, we opened at eight o'clock, we closed at five o'clock. And would we have the capacity to work remotely? Sure. But was it efficient or easy or painless? Not really. Um, and we were had the expectation that we were in the office eight to five, pretty much no matter what. You know, when life happens, you know, oh, I have this dentist appointment and I have the only time I could get in was, you know, 1.30 on a Tuesday afternoon, but it's out 
Southwest where I live and I don't live anywhere close to the law office, you know, I'm probably not going to go back downtown. I'm probably just going to maybe take the rest of the day off or try to do some other work as I can, but I'm not being efficient about it. And it's a time suck um, because I'm not able to work effectively and efficiently. And so it, we used to be pretty traditional and pretty rigid, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then COVID happened and we all went to a happy hour on a Friday in March. And the next Monday, we didn't go back to the office for over a year. Yeah. And so um, we switched instantaneously on how we worked, where we worked, and when we worked out of a necessity. But that really propelled us forward as it did the rest of the legal industry. So we go from being really rigid and specific about when we were working to basically I felt like we were all just sort of working around the clock whenever we could fit it in. When we were doing Zoom schools, we were doing whatever we had to do. Um, so we went from kind of one extreme to the other. And so now we're really trying to take what would the, what is the best parts of both of those worlds that supports our clients um, and supports our team. And so one of the things that we did um, during COVID when we were all feeling very burnt out was we saw that we were being more efficient and we could track that using Clio data. So we reduced our working hours from eight to five to eight to four. So we have never gone back. And so I can't tell you what that one hour means to me. I don't know that I could go back to having expectation of being in the office until five o'clock every single day. Um, you know, with little kids, if I leave at five, I don't get home until six by the time I do both pickups. And if my little guy goes to bed at 7.15, it's heartbreaking to not have to spend enough time with them. So if you, that extra hour is so important and impactful and meaningful that, A, if we ever did try to go back, there'd be like a revolt for sure. <laughs> um, but it adds so much more ease to like my evening and my life that it's something that we took a risk and we weren't sure if, you know, were we going to be able to swing it financially? But people are definitely more productive during the day because they know they want to, they want to be able to get out at four and go get their kids and get dinner started. Um, when the same on the flip side, so my kids are grown, so it's not so much for that me. I, the hybrid working and I get to sleep an extra hour in the morning. I'm like, bring it like that alone. You add that up over the course of time. Even three days a week, I sleep in an extra hour, eliminate my commute. I've just gotten and gained it like two nights of additional sleep over the course of a month. Mm -hmm. That is rejuvenating too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's what we do now. We require everybody to be in office on Mondays. We think that sets the tone for the week. We do our you know roundtable 20 minute meeting in the morning. And then that's when we do our like attorney paralegal check-ins on the cases. So we set ourselves up, we identify what what's happening this week? What are the urgent to do's? What's my um, game plan? And then from there, attorneys are able to work remotely when they don't have in-office appointments or meetings. Paralegals are in office at least twice a week to have that camaraderie, to be able to you know, run ideas off each other. Um, and then our support team is in office most of the time. But we found having that built-in face-to-face, all team, connectedness um, really has kind of kept like that meaning and impact piece that's really important to our culture and what we saw is one of the reasons why people were um, leaving their jobs that's really alive because we still feel like we're all working towards the same goal the same vision um, because we're connected with one another but we're now we're definitely not as rigid as we once were in terms of who's in the office at what time and when but it's a double-edged sword too because again if I can work whenever and wherever, then we're never truly unplugged. So we really do encourage our employees to stick to the eight to four office hours. Of course, there's going to be times when we're working beyond that. And, and that's okay if it's every once in a while. You know, when we think of work-life balance at Koenig Dunn, we don't think of work-life balance in a vacuum day by day. You know, it doesn't have to be try to get it perfect every single day. We're really looking at over cycles of weeks, of months, of quarters. And if it's over a year and you're still struggling, we need to readdress it. Um, so we're really trying to find the sweet spot of in-office hybrid, strict hours, flexible hours, where our clients are taken care of, number one. We're all working you know, we're all available to each other when we really do need to be available to each other, but then accounting for the humanness that is going to happen 
day in, week in, month in and out. So well, you made a good point about not. So I think people get confused. Like when we talk about work life balance, it's it's not every day in and of itself. It's generally speaking, are you balanced? Um, last year was a really intense year for me. Uh, I in 23 years, I think it's 24 now, but I just don't want to feel that old. Um, in 23, 24 years of doing this, I had the largest divorce case I've ever worked on in my life. Um, it was, they partners took all the other cases off my desk. That's how intense this divorce was. It was the only case I worked on 37.5 hours a week, all day, every day. And I was working 60, 70 hour weeks sometimes. That's not work-life balance. But when Angela and Angela came to me and said, you know what, we're going to get through this. We have a trial date in December. And when it's over, we're giving you six weeks off and we're not giving you your, not taking out of your PCO. That almost immediately recalibrated my energy. And I know not every firm can do this, but it was forced time off saying, we appreciate you. We know you're working hard. We know your family is not up there right now and you're investing a lot of time into this case, but we see you and we're going to force you to take time off. So that got me through it though. When there's a light at the end of the tunnel, people will grind and grind and grind. So that was, she could have threw money at me. She could have said, oh, here, here's a bonus check, but with, what would that have done for me and my health? I would have never made it probably another year after that type of intense casework. So um, really, it was amazing. I did reset um, and we made it through, which kind of ties into the other thing that you guys yeah. do. So for Michaela, we just, it was so clear. She was so burnt out and we don't want to lose Michaela. She's amazing. And so what are we going to do? We're going to take a short-term financial hit so we can have her for the long haul. Um, and it's no, absolutely no regrets. It's something that absolutely needed to happen. And you come back and better and stronger and more invested in wanting to work really hard for the greater good of the firm. So uh, I'm pretty sure I annoyed people because I walked in. I wanted to like have this slow mo video of me with fire in the background walking into the firm like I'm back, bitch. <laughs> like watch out, and everyone's like, "You are so annoying. You just got six weeks off work, and we've been grinding out covering all your work." You know, no, no it was amazing, and um, yeah, I'm here, and I was re-energized, and I'm back to you know in the grind. So another thing that we try to do for everyone is at the end of the year, kind of that same mentality. We work really hard all year long. And if you know you have a break coming, it can propel you through. So we close at the last two weeks of every year, um, which the first time we did it was very scary. Um, we weren't sure what it was going to do for cash flow. We weren't sure what it was going to do. Um, how our, if, what if there's an emergency? What if our clients have nonstop emergencies? Um, how are we going to make this work? But we set a plan in January that we were going to close for the last two weeks of the year. And we just kind of worked backward. What are we going to have to do? Well, we're going to have to maybe save some cash for cash flow for December. We are going to start notifying our clients in November. So nobody is surprised. Nobody's panicking that they're not going to have access to their lawyer. All the legal needs are going to be taken care of. We have to figure out who's checking e-filing, who's checking phones, who's on call in case there is an emergency. Um, so we just, we've only gotten better and better and better about like the practicals pieces of it. But the first time we did it, we were definitely nervous, um, but it was fine. Our clients, you know, there are real, no true, true, true emergencies that I can solve overnight anyway in family law, especially when the judges are out on their holiday break anyway, and opposing counsel are barely working. So it's a great time to close just for that reason. Um, and a lot of times on the calendar year where the holidays fall, you know, we say it, it is two weeks off, but I mean, when you add in Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, the day after Christmas, New Year's Eve, most people aren't working anyway. So to add on two full weeks plus the weekends, um, I think some days it ends, it's years, it ends up being 16 days off in a row. If you say that to your team, what that does for the ability for them to push through and maintain a sense of all is well, I got this, um, 
is really um, inspiring. And we're all working towards that goal together because we all want to make sure we have that for each other. Um, so that team first, um, you know, the admin team wants to take care of our paralegals. They want to take care of our lawyers because they're just as thankful as they get the two weeks off that we do. And so um, we're also very intentional at that time, though, and setting our people up for success. So, you know, we say this is time that is precious and valuable. Spend it well. If we hear you come back and you ran yourself ragged and you are exhausted on January 2nd and complaining about how tired you are, you know, we're going to be a little frustrated by that because we want you to be intentional about at least carving out some time to restore your energy and come back rejuvenated and refreshed. Absolutely. And I think since we've been doing it in 2015, I cannot think of a single um, true emergency that has come up. And um, the team, the psychological safety, if something were to come up, every single paralegal would be like, what can I do to help? I want to help you because we care about each other. You, we've established that trust and we want to take care of each other truly. So so if it were to even happen, people, it would be all hands on deck, yeah. you know. And so. what's cool about it is we start putting it in our signature blocks that the office will be closed for these two weeks, probably in November. Um, so now everybody in the community knows that we do this. When people come to us for jobs, when they're applying, it's one of the reasons they know that we close for two weeks into them. That's a signal that they're um, hopefully going to be experiencing some work-life balance. Other lawyers talk about it. Other law firms are now mimicking it that in, um, in our community um, because they know we do it. They've seen us being able to do it year after year. Um, so it's definitely rubbing off on people. And that's great if we can encourage other lawyers who maybe don't have the full culture of the vulnerability and the framework, if they can at least give their people start with the two weeks, um, hopefully their law firms will be more sustainable and their practices will be more sustainable too. And there's something to be said for the chunk of time. So um, I don't know. I always, over the years, I'll take this Friday off. I always tack my PTO days on to make, to make them go longer. So I have, you know, a weekend off, but Probably like most of you, if, if you do happen to get a week off, it takes you three days to unplug. The fourth day, you're like, oh, this is, this is fun. The fifth day, you're like, I never want to go back to work. And then it's, it's just that cycle. So there's something to be said about the large block of time where people actually do get to take the time, unplug, write it out, and come back refreshed, so, yeah. which is rare to find that. And we have just a, a couple of other little instances where you know we point to prioritizing rest and mental wellness so you know after a trial let's say i prepare for a trial all week i get there of course it settles at 8 30 a.m before the judge even steps on the bench right and after i've printed 350 yeah. exhibits so of course that's what's going to happen there is zero expectation that our lawyer is coming back to the office now to catch up on emails and to do whatever else they've neglected for the rest of the week it's mentally exhausting to go through that process and you're you know high on adrenaline and you're going to crash and we want you to go home and rest so it's practice what you preach you know we have no expectation that people are um grinding every second of the day and that's a perfect time for them to go home decompress and we'll come back tomorrow and we'll get after it but that only works because then you know i know Jaden. all right this this trial settled for her she's going home, I'm going to make sure I'm going to take care of her clients for the day in case something happens. So again, that cross team support is the only way it works, or you just get further and further and further behind. And then you're more stressed out than you were. It's not even worth it to go home. You know, um, we give people their birthdays off, like let them have their birthdays, celebrate them, be excited for them to take the time off. You know, we go around the room on that Monday morning and people are saying, I am taking a mental health day on Thursday. I am doing this. And we're saying, great you know what, what we should all be doing is pre-scheduling out our mental health days so they're actually on the calendar or else we never end up taking them. So we really encourage people to do that too. So it's kind of just the lexicon of making it okay for people to give themselves that permission to do what they need to do to make this entire practice sustainable, especially in family law, because it gets so hard. It does. And, you know, the statistics aren't great for you lawyers and doctors with substance abuse. Um, you got to rely on your team and you, we got to take care of each other. So, um, that's, those are, yeah. Our, and of course, 
out of we do this all with Clio. You know, Clio really does help us. This is not like a sales pitch, I promise you that. But <laughs> we use Clio to help facilitate running our business, running our cases, running the practice so we can focus on our people and focus on our clients. Um, so it's having the crossing yeah, the tools, the yeah. right tools. Yeah. Clio is the biggest part of our tech stack. So we couldn't do our day to day without it. But at making sure your team has the right tools to do what they need to do. Yep. Um, super important. So. All right. Thank you, Angela and Michaela. Um, we're going to open it now to audience questions, but so you don't get burnt out by screaming up here. We have our lovely Laura in the back who's waving around a mic uh, and she will run up to you. But I'm just going to ask that you wait to speak until you get the mic. All right. So, hi, uh, JC Fisher. Thank you for y'all's time. Um, I have a question about workloads. So, for example, we're in a multi-practice firm. We have five major practice areas. Three, is a, three of which are litigation, um, two of which are complex litigation. And we're averaging about like 44 to 50 cases per attorney. And so my question is, um, what, it, what do y'all do to make sure your caseloads are not like through the roof per attorney? Because we are looking at, you know, 70 to 80 hours per week. Um, we raise our prices. So we have less cases. Um, and we balance it out. We go through, they rotate the consultations and who's getting which cases. And then if I just happen to do a bunch of consultations and I have a lot of clients retain, we're saying, okay, is this a, my client that needs me? Or I know another lawyer on the team who's equally as amazing. Is this a case that that person can take? So we are trying to be thoughtful about who's getting what cases. And when we get unbalanced, we try to rebalance as much as the client experience will allow. Like we don't want clients feeling like they're getting shuffled around or they don't have their primary person. Um, But we say no to cases um, because for us, we want to do really high quality work, but we want to have balance too. And it is so hard to say no. Um, But we've been there when 70 cases, that's what it was when Michaela came on, she and I, you know, and it's, it's rough. The whole numbers thing drives me nuts, right? Because I, so I don't, I haven't even really talked to Angela about this, but I have this whole plan in my head about coming up with a weighted case model. Mm-hmm. So last year I had one case on my desk. That doesn't mean Michaela didn't have anything to do. I was working so intense. I had one case. It was very complex, very intense. So when someone says, oh, I have 70 cases. And I'm like, well, what are they all name changes? Cause like, that's not, I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. But, but 70 cases to one person in my one case, my, my one case, even though it's the number. So I think it's important to look at the complexity of the cases, how that complexity is being distributed. Um, so I think that that's important. I think in our culture, the, the vulnerability, the feedback, where are you out on the burnout, that organically lends itself to people saying, I am overwhelmed. I need help. I have too much on my plate. And people feeling safe enough to not feel like they're gonna get fired because they suck. All right, thank you. I have a quick question. You named so many amazing examples of what Onindan is doing that's so different from what we've traditionally seen in law. What has been your really big metrics of success of implementing these policies and practices? I think the biggest one for us is just our retention rate for our team. We have very, very few people who leave the team by choice. And a lot of our people have been with us and just have never left. I mean, our senior paralegal has been there 25 years. Michaela, you know, you're going on 10. Um, So the retention rate kind of speaks for itself, I would say. Right. Okay. I'm going to pass it to another person in the audience. I saw a few hands before. Oh, Hi. Um, we're a family law firm in Chicago and we really struggle with the billable hour versus time off. So do you guys have a billable hour requirement and how does that play into the flex schedules? Um, and also do, do any flex time like during the summers or court holidays or that sort of thing? Um, we do have billable hour requirements, but when we're setting the goals for the year, we take into account everyone getting two weeks of vacation, 
and hopefully closing for two weeks at the end of the year and then counting backwards from there about what their hourly goal should be instead of just saying, here is the goal and then do what you got to do to get hit it. So we definitely take a hit financially. So if it was just about profit and generating revenue, we would make different decisions. Um, so we have a more reasonable hourly goal, billable goal to account for. We want sustainability. All right. Do you, I think like a lot of us have heard recently, like the concept of quiet quitting, which is just doing the bare minimum, not going above and beyond with your employer. And we see it, I think a lot in the the younger generations. And I'll say that because I think I'm part of that here. I don't know. Um, but what do you think law firms can do to kind of prevent that from happening? And, you know, in a culture that's rewarded burning out. Okay. Uh, okay. My, well, I'm, I'm old school. Like I'm like, so quiet quitting to me, I, I get it. Great. But also to me, like have a conversation. If, if you are overextending yourself, you feel like you're undercompensated, have the conversation with your employer about it. It feels out of integrity to do the quiet quitting to me. Um, and what does it really mean? It means you're not communicating with your employer or your employer doesn't make it easy or give you the vehicle or the tool to provide that feedback. So I just couldn't see that happening. I guess where we're at, not that it wouldn't, but I'm just saying if those tools are in place for people, to, they feel safe. They can tell you, I am, I don't feel like I'm being compensated fairly. I need more time off. I'm burnt out. I just, I'm unmotivated. Help me have the conversation. So young people, I don't know. But see, yeah. I know it's trending and all that. There's quiet firing too. I, so. Yeah. I think if people are like a symptom is just being disengaged. Um, and for me, I, I would equate that to people not finding meaning or value or seeing the impact of their role. And so we do try really hard to tie. I mean, not every single day is the legal administrator who is e-filing all of our pleadings all day, every day. She's not individually feeling like what's the greater good, what's the greater goal, but she knows her, we value everyone on the team so deeply for their role that people are feeling that they're, they understand their contribution and without her, no files would get open and nothing would get filed day in or day out. We couldn't do our jobs without her, you know? So she knows how much she's valued. Um, but yeah, I think if people are disengaged and they're quiet quitting, I think it's either, um, you know, they're not being provided an opportunity to understand what their value is or how they, they're connecting to their meaning or impact. So maybe start there and figure that out for yourself and work, work downward, I would say. All right. And I know we're almost at time, but say you're a firm leaving here today, you've really implemented no policies or anything to kind of stray away from what we've seen traditionally in legal. Where, where do you start? I would start with a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every team member and asking like, what's going really well? What's not going well? What do you wish would change? Um, and kind of hearing it from your people first and then trying to figure out how do we meet some of those needs if it makes sense instead of pretending to know because you know we meet our people's needs but if we don't know what the needs are we could be completely missing the mark so asking and establishing that psychological safety because you probably won't get an honest answer if someone feels like whatever i say could be used against me so i think that that's really important and modeling it for your team members if you're saying i really messed this up i am sorry We've all made mistakes. So starting to model that vulnerability, um, I think is a great starting point too. Amazing. All right. Thank you so much, Michaela and Angela. And thank you all for being with us here this afternoon. Our final keynote is going to kick off in just a bit. Um, but, and the slides will be available online later. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of ClioCon. Thank you. Thanks guys.